spend some time on. Heather, sorry, uh, Hussein. Um, we've just started the recording feature earlier, okay. but we will edit. We'll of course edit the um, presentation to start with uh, Dr. Lakhavan's uh, presentation, and we'll remove the um, upfront introductions. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Can't hear anything. Yeah, we stopped talking. <laughs> Hi, sorry, it's Hussein Narani from BCBSA. We're just gathering um, for the call. We should start in, in a few minutes. Thank you. Recording. I'm not hearing anything. Heather, I'm um, sorry, good afternoon, it's uh, Hussein. Uh, Heather, we could begin if uh, with the introduction, please. Sure. Okay, uh, welcome and good afternoon, everyone, to the February Genetics Webinar. Today we are very pleased to have as our presenter, Dr. Felicitas Lachbauen, who is the Medical Director of Genetics at Quest Diagnostics Nichols Institute. Today she will be presenting next-gen sequence panel testing for hereditary cancer syndrome and for cancer targeted therapy. And before we begin, though, I would just like to remind everyone, please mute your line during the presentation. And we will open up the um, conversation at the end of the presentation for questions. And as always, the webinar is being recorded. So Dr. Uh, um it's all yours. Thank you, Heather. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to um, present to you this topic for today, and hopefully it would be helpful in your um, individual uh, uh, companies or um, uh, offices. So, sorry for that. So understanding the application NGS panel testing for hereditary cancer syndromes and cancer 
targeted therapy. I would try to cover as much in terms of the content of the NGS panels, how they are put together, how they can be validated, what are the guidelines that are controlling or um, burning the use of these test panels, as well, both in germline as well as in somatic um, cancers. So, for, based on the 2015 Cancer Fact, American Cancer Society, it's like there are areas in the United States where there are more than 100,000 cases per year, and that is actually in California, Florida, New York, and Texas. Um, the 10 most primary cancer sites are prostate, breast, female, um, cancer, lung cancer, colon, rectum, um, uterus, and uh, pretty much um, some of this, or except prostate, uh, a lot of this are part of the hereditary cancer syndrome. By distribution, 80% of cancers are sporadic, meaning that there's no germline mutation or inherited uh, gene that's causing the cancer. Um, 10 to 15 percent are familial, meaning that they occur in families and they could be low penetrance and they need a gene environment interaction or both um, to cause cancer. The 5 to 10 percent, though, are inherited cancers and they arise from highly penetrant germline mutations. Inherited, um, inheriting a genetic mutation or pathogenic variant does not mean that the patient or the um, person who has the variant develops cancer, but it increases his or her risk. The most common hereditary cancers are breast, ovarian, colorectal, and prostate cancer. Um, understanding if cancer is due to an inherited pathogenic mutation can help clarify the risk of developing cancer, and it also helps determine options for cancer function as governed by guidelines and possibly therapy. Custom cancer risks for common cancers are more or less variable, but it actually is um, around the range of almost 40 to 80 percent um, cancer risk hereditary uh, versus the general population. As an example, breast cancer, um, BRCA2 has 4 in 10 uh, versus BRCA1, which is 6, 6 in 10, chances of developing cancer by the age of 70. So what are the red flags of inherited uh, cancer uh, in a family or in, a, in an individual? So cancer in two or more closely related relatives, multiple generations affected by depending on what type of cancer there is, and early age of diagnosis, multiple primary tumors, bilateral or rare cancers, as well as constellation of tumors consistent with specific cancer syndromes, and certain ethnic backgrounds like the Ashkenazi Jewish panel, uh, I mean cancers, can be um, a clue that there is an inherited uh, susceptibility gene. So, Patient's family history is one good clue that something is um, happening in the family that could be inherited. With the um, improvement or advances in technology, the cost per genome has drastically changed uh, since 2007, and with that, um, the massive parallel sequencing or next generation sequencing had really propelled the use of this technology in a lot of Sanger-based sequencing, um, and that we can also um, utilize that technology to um, interrogate several genes at a time. So right now, we, when we talk about sequencing, we would be able to do several things. We can do risk management depending on the diagnostic test that actually is um, used for certain gene panels or certain genes, and we can use it also for screening when we apply it to high-risk patients and identify the disease early before the cancer um, occurs, and also for diagnosis 
um, when we would want to ascertain what kind of um, cancer that patient has and staging, of course, as well as therapy selection. And I would expound on the therapy selection when I get to the solid tumors and, of course, monitoring for efficacy. The workflow for cancer gene panel um, pretty much is similar to any next generation sequencing. What varies is actually the input or the source, of the DNA or the RNA. So normally for germline um, cancer panel testing, we use blood. Um, uh, there are some times when you would use FFP if um, you know that there's a somatic mutation that could be subtracted, you would have a germline mutation from, um, from removing the somatic mutations. And sometimes, um, rarely though, um, this is not yet established, but eventually if there is a germline mutation uh, that can be followed using circulating um, free DNA. But right now, most of the cancer um, germline panels are run uh, using blood. So just so, how did we go? so after DNA extraction or RNA extraction, the library of PrEP is uh, done, and then the target enrichment is something that is important to remember because this is where different laboratories really differ, and depending on how they capture the DNA or the RNA, pretty much that could give you the sensitivity, specificity, as well as the um, um, depth of coverage and also the type of um, coverage within the whole gene, whether they include the promoter sites or the um, other um, genetic um, structure um, within the gene. So then after that, sequencing can be normally done depending on um, what platform is available in that laboratory. And of course, the other uh, thing that differentiates its lab would be the informatics that's being used, meaning the informatics pipeline, because that would actually um, uh, differ in each of the laboratories that do certain gene panels. Um, the reporting is also something that it may differ within the lab. So just a review, um, the normal or the more common test that one can do is BRCA1, BRCA2, and therefore breast ovarian cancer and the most common high-risk breast cancer susceptibility syndrome because they occur in one in 300 to one in 800 individuals, more so in Ashkenazi Jewish where they have one in 40 uh, individuals. So, the cancer risk by age 70 for BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation carriers without personal history of cancer is uh, reflected in this table. So for female breast cancer with BRCA1 mutation, it's up to 65%, and for BRCA2, it's up to 47%, and for ovarian cancer, 39% for BRCA1 and 17% for BRCA2. And for male breast cancer, um, more so on BRCA2, it's 6.8%. So there are uh, other hereditary breast cancer genes, and every year there are more than 200,000 women in the U.S. that are diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, I mentioned earlier that it is mostly BRCA1, BRCA2, but there are certain genes um, which are highlighted in this um, uh, figure, like TP53, P10, STK11, CDH1, and POV2 that are also responsible for um, breast cancer and around 4% of cases. So um, genes with highest um, increased risk for breast cancer, um, as I mentioned earlier, are, can be included with BRCA1, BRCA2 in the panel, and that increases the number or the presence of um, cases that can be detected with that panel. So why are they included in a panel? Pretty much one would understand that breast cancer tumor genesis, it actually um, affects DNA repair, that is BRCA1 and 2 and CHECK2, chromatin remodeling for BRCA1 and as well as protein ubiquitination. There is cell cycle regulation um, is regulated by P53 and apoptosis or cell death by P10 as well as cell proliferation. So 
these genes participate, or the products of these genes participate in tumor genesis in different ways, and that actually um, is the reason why they are put in certain panels for BRCA testing or for breast and ovarian uh, cancer testing. Okay. Can I just hold on a second? Right. You probably need to go that route. Sorry for that. I have a competing lecture on the other side. Okay, so just to show that the diagram BRCA1 and BRCA2, they actually form complexes with the Fanconi anemia core complex, and they do repair DNA that are damaged and um, they also promote chromosome uh, stability. So I wouldn't belabor some of these uh, components, but just showing the fact that there are certain genes that interact with BRCA1 and BRCA2, and these are the Fanconi genes as well as the ATM and PALB2. So, um, BRCA1, BRCA2, we know it's hereditary, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. TP53 is actually um, responsible for Lee-Fraumeni syndrome, P10 for the hamartoma tumor syndrome, which includes Cowden syndrome, and then CDH1 for hereditary diffuse cancer, gastric cancer, and Poitzjager uh, syndrome for STK11 and PALB2 with uh, associated breast cancer. In terms of lifetime risk for breast cancer, TP53 has a relative risk of 6.4 times when you have a mutation, a pathogenic mutation, a likely pathogenic mutation for TP53. And then P10 we have for breast cancer, 85% approximately at the age of 70 years of age. CDH1, lobular breast cancer risk of 39% to 52% by age 80 years of age. And STK11, breast cancer risk of 45% uh, by age 70, and Paul B2 breast cancer of 35% by age 70. Then, the, as I mentioned earlier too, there are several other cancers that can be associated with the different um, genes, and for TP53, um, bone, connective tissue, brain, pancreas, colon, and liver are also increased in patients who have TP53 um, mutations. And for Cowden, um, besides breast, uh, one can have thyroid, endometrial, renal, colorectal, and melanoma. And of course, um, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer in males and females may differ. And then Poitzjager for um, gastrointestinal cancer, including pancreatic cancer, 11% by age 70. So, the NCCM guideline actually gives a very um, well-defined um, criteria for testing based on age, family history, personal history. And pretty much, um, I wouldn't read through the whole um, criteria, but it does tell you who are to be tested and that within the family, you can actually identify who needs to be tested after an individual in the family has been um, documented to have a mutation. Um, and of course, within the NCCN guidelines, there are also um, management guidelines for women and men who have the mutation, and um, ranging from um, breast examination, MRI, as well as um, um, other um, procedures that would prevent development of uh, associated cancers within the family or within the patient. So um, this table just summarizes what are the guidelines that are out there and probably justifies why these NGS panels are really offered um, to individuals who really fulfill the genetic testing criteria. So for BRCA1, BRCA2, and TP53, as well as P10, NCCM guidelines have the genetic familial high-risk assessment breast ovarian, and then for CDH1, there is an international gastric cancer linkage of consortium um, consensus 
guidelines, and although SKK11 and PALB2 don't have genetic testing criteria, um, NCCN has genetic familial high-risk assessment for colorectal in SDK11, as well as ACS has recommended um, guidelines for PALB2. So why expanded menu? Uh, remember I mentioned the BRCA1, BRCA2 explains 15 to 20 percent of hereditary breast cancer cases. And with the additional uh, genes, which are TP53, P10, CDH1, SDK11, and PALB2, which are mostly um, probably um, not just high um, penetrance, but low, um, moderate to high, uh, to high penetrance, breast cancer susceptibility genes can explain up to 4.5% of hereditary breast cancers. So. That in itself justifies the fact that the seven genes can be put together as an um, initial screen for patients with breast cancer that would fulfill genetic testing criteria. So um, I mentioned that pop v 2 is an emerging um, gene, and pretty much um, right now there are more um, reports of pop v 2 positive breast cancer uh, patients. So, that, it looks like that should be enough, but not, no, not really because um, there are other genes that are actually responsible for breast cancer uh, risk also. And just here, just summarizing the fact that when will you use a panel versus just BRCA1, BRCA2, um, depending on um, the family history, one can actually uh, prioritize BRCA1, BRCA2 if it's mostly hereditary breast cancer ovarian and um, um, but if there's a mixture of uh, within the same family of certain other um, cancers, one can opt to take the seven genes or even a 34 gene, which actually I can um, explain. Okay, so right now in certain laboratories, there is just BRCA1, BRCA2 as complete coding exon sequencing, and that can be just the comprehensive BRCA1, BRCA2. There are times when a family member has been tested with the single mutation or variant within the family, especially in Ashkenazi Jewish um, families, where they have specifically any one of these common mutations, then they can just be screened for that type of mutation. Um, the other things that can happen is that if the family is Ashkenazi Jewish, but then um, the Ashkenazi Jewish screen is negative, one can order a reflex for the comprehensive so that the, the whole axon of, axons of BRCA1 and BRCA2 can be tested. Um, single site means that within the family there's a known pathogenic mutation, and so when ordering a test, the clinician can just order that specific mutation so that the lab doesn't have to sequence the whole BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. And then um, there are times in the early days where rearrangements were not tested. One can also do adjust the rearrangement if the BRCA1, BRCA2 were sequenced earlier and not the rearrangement. Then I mentioned that um, the seven gene panel we can call expanded panel, and who are the cases that would need those, this panel? Um, it depends um, sometimes when the family history is not very specific and not focusing or directing um, the test to just um, BRCA1, BRCA2, then you can order a seven gene panel, uh, including BRCA1, BRCA2, TP53, P10, CDH11, STK11, and PALB2. Um, you can do a reflex also. You can just do BRCA1, BRCA2. Then later on, if it's negative and it's still um, the patient has um, some other um, family members involved, you can do um, a reflex of the five genes or just the five genes if the um, BRCA1, BRCA2 was earlier tested and there were no point mutations, deletions, or duplications. Then comes the bigger panel, and this has been up and coming in different laboratories, and um, I'm just showing you what we have, but pretty much the reason why they are put together is because they can have 
that only breast cancer here, we have the seven gene panel that I discussed earlier, but then we in, uh, within the other genes, which are actually, chances are they're low to moderate risk and low penetrance, they can also cause breast cancer and some other uh, cancers like ovarian cancer. Um, and um, for this other genes, which are actually Lynch uh, syndrome genes, they can also um, cause breast cancer. And I'll discuss a paper that was just um, published and just to show you that there is some reason why cancer predisposition panel is um, bigger compared to the more uh, high penetrance genes because of the different conditions that can be tested for the 34 gene panel. So here's a paper by Desmond, and it was just published recently at the JAMA Oncology 2015. And pretty much you have different labs here. They, we have, there are 34 genes in two laboratories and 25 genes in one laboratory. And here's what the gene um, uh, panel that this study did. They actually included 1,054 cases, which are BRCA1 and 2 negative, and they went through um, all the testing and found that there are 63 of those 1024 cases that are positive for other genes other than BRCA1, BRCA2, and significantly actually um, uh, affected management um, as well as familial testing. So it does support the need or the use for um, multiple gene panels and pretty much the advantage of having this um, multiple gene panel is you would have a lower turnaround time and you cover several genes at the time. However, um, just to iterate some of the uh, differences in the different panels that are being offered out there, um, one would need to understand that they were validated in different ways depending on the platform that they were um, ran. And at the same time, there should be an accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, specificity limits of detection for each of the lab that had validated this test. One very important thing to consider too is that not only the panel, the contents of the panel itself, but also the assay design and the genes that are included in that panel because there are certain genes that are actually very difficult to do uh, massive parallel sequencing because they can have pseudogenes. And I just gave one, uh, two genes here, the CHECK2 and the PMS2 pseudogenes can complicate sequencing. And so if the laboratory is offering these two genes, pretty much uh, one can ask them what are the ways that they had um, improved on so that they are sure that they're not um, sequencing the pseudogenes but rather the real gene. And then, of course, um, the, the third one here where uh, laboratories do optimize their conditions in terms of capturing the real exonic sequence as well as the flanking sequence using DNA, I mean RNA base or some other ways of capturing the um, sequence of interest because there are times when there are some intronic sequences that are common, um, commonly um, affected in some genes, and those need to be, I'm sorry, why am I think I'm disconnected. I don't see any slides on my, sorry, okay, so got it. Um, so, with all this um, technicalities within the assay design, one should understand that there's also a difference between using tissue and blood and um, the mechanism for capturing low copy number variants as well as uh, addressing MOSE system. And uh, the other one is also the type of mutation or rearrangement that one actually can see using that assay because some assays would not be um, um, detecting the CNBs as well as large rearrangement, more so for massive parallel sequencing, triplet repeats are difficult to um, actually identify, although they don't occur in, some of the, in most of these genes that we have anyway for the NGS panels for cancer. And again, 
uh, sequencing performance and quality metrics need to be um, understood as well as I mentioned earlier, the bioinformatics pipeline is also important because some bioinformatics pipelines actually do not detect small deletions um, and they can be missed. Okay, so yeah, at any rate, once you have a pipeline that is working and annotation and classification is pretty much standard, However, in different laboratories also, multiple data-based um, sources are um, something to highlight. Uh, there are publicly available mutation databases, and some of them are reported or recorded here in the slide, so everybody can use those, but there are certain private databases that others can um, query and um, consortia and other um, companies that are actually in um, participation or in um, collaboration with other foreign uh, laboratories. So those are the things that can happen in terms of annotation and variations in annotation, but hopefully with more public databases and more publications, pretty much um, every um, or most of the variants can be annotated similarly. Um, there are multiple reviews for VUS and pathogenic cases in most laboratories, and anything that can be reclassified within a certain period of time can be done um, by the lab and contact um, the clinician who had ordered the test. Co-segregation family studies can help in VUS reclassification, and I think um, some labs are doing those, and of course, um, Pretty much most of the labs or all of the labs are doing final interpretation by board certified directors who are experienced in um, interpretation. So in a breast cancer report, besides the fact that the turnaround time is um, um, important, one can reflex the options within 21 days, at least within our lab, and the interpretation summary, depending on which lab you're um, sending your test, but pretty much they are categorized and highlighted and all of the ACMG guidelines are utilized. So that uh, actually um, is the germline side of cancer um, sequencing. I'm shifting to solid tumors, um, and if uh, you have any questions, we'll take it at the end of the talk. So solid tumors, um, Many of you probably have, um, if you remember in med school, or, or at least um, the theory that you have to have a double hit to have tumors, or you have an environmental factor that affects um, a previous mutation within the tumor uh, um, producing genes before you can have tumor. And that becomes a little more um, of a challenge in terms of testing and thus um, we have solid tumors with multiple genes and pathways being altered, suppressor genes as well as oncogenes being affected, and with that, a lot of therapies have been developed targeting specific genes as well as um, um, other molecules within the cells that could help prevent cell proliferation or induce cell death, and of course, um, clinical annotation as well as clinical utility must be established before testing can be offered. So the clinical view of cancer, one could see the different stages or the different um, cell activity that can be affected during tumor um, formation, and that basically you're either inducing proliferation, preventing death of the cell, or pretty much uh, there is a driver mutation within that type of cell that actually causes the proliferation of that cell. Um, so here it's just giving you a broad um, view of cancer and what are the possible inhibitors or therapy that can be developed to target specifically those activities within the cell that produce cancer. So, Cancer pathways and targeted treatments. 
most of you must have you must have heard of a lot of receptor antagonists, um, um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and some of these other gene uh, products that can be inhibited within the intracellular um, part of the cells. And um, any part or any um, protein within these pathways can be inhibited, or depending on what the mutation or variants that can occur, they can actually have a constitutional uh, activation of that receptor leading to cell proliferation or um, some um, um, inhibition of apoptosis. And this actually just summarizes the fact that there are several uh, receptors, cell receptors that can be shared by different cancers and that um, certain drugs or emerging um, therapeutic um, agents can be used um, to target certain cancers and um, they can also be used in some other non-specific um, 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 cancers depending on um, the target. So just to give you an example, lung cancer, uh, erlotinib is that, um, one of the drugs that can um, be used for treatment of lung cancer and it is pretty much inhibiting the EGFR um, mutated uh, receptor action. So uh, again, just you can probably look at the slides again, but I don't need to belabor the point that several um, genes responsible for tumor genesis are shared by a lot of solid tumors. And there are specific solid tumors that we're in. They're very much really more related to um, a specific tumor. But again, since they share different genes and they can have driver mutations in different um, solid tumors, then one can use a targeted mutation for that specific gene uh, product. For lung, uh, for lung cancer, pretty much, and some solid cancers, they have at least a dozen of shared genes that one can target, and that's the rationale in why some of the hotspots um, that are commercially available are being used in different laboratories, and of course for lung, melanoma, breast, and colorectal, here are all the genes that are actually being targeted by some commercially available and some IVD um, diagnostic kits. And um, that in itself, um, pretty much because of the hotspots, one can easily direct or target that particular cancer based on the cancer profile. So in most next generation sequencing, um, there are several targeted actionable genes. For us, we have a 34 gene panel. and. It is applicable to all solid tumors, and it's annotated, directed at FDA-approved drugs. And sometimes with the more um, or the less common uh, genes, we have clinical trials that are available. And most of uh, the other labs, as well as us, we actually can suggest which of these clinical trials can be used depending on the variants that are actually identified. Uh, after the sequencing. So for next generation sequencing for solid tumor, one can use FFPE tissue, small biopsies, FNAs, and sometimes there are um, tests that we're in. One can use um, some other um, types of cells, but um, uh, for the most part, it's FFPE. As an example, um, lung cancer. So. There are treatment options based on molecular profile, as I alluded to earlier, and specifically for lung cancer, if you have an EGF or X and 18, 19, 21 and mutation, you could use erlotinib and for the other mutations in EGFR, as well as some of the positive KRAS mutations for 12, 13, and 61, this um, drug cannot be used because it's non-responsive. So this table just gives you a flavor of um, the different antibodies or the different drugs that can actually um, antagonize um, the driver mutations. And here are the different 
genes here based on um, um, the mutations, and then here are all the different used for each of the different um, gene specific mutations that can occur in lung cancer, specifically the non small cell lung cancer. So, um, in most cases, um, these are the ones that are targeted for diagnostic or profile. So for lung cancer, uh, essential is EGFR, BRAF, and ALK. Um, some have used ROS1, RET, MET, FISH, as well as uh, HER2 mutation uh, detection. And for colorectal, KRAS, NRAS, HRAS, PIK3CA, and BRAF. And for melanoma, BRAF and KIT. So, for the ones that are not commonly associated with hot spots, and if they're negative in this more um, hot spot directed um, and less um, number of genes that are commonly uh, tested, one can use a gene panel that can encompass more genes that are actually causing um, um, driver mutations that are um, associated with cancer. So, again, this is level one association between genes and FDA-approved therapies, and ranging from BRAF, EGFR, HRAS, KIT, RET, SM, uh, Smoothen, KRAS, and NRAS, and here are all the tumor types here, ranging from melanoma to colorectal cancer, and then the association of the different mutations that can occur whether they are sensitive or resistant to the specific drugs on column two. Um, this can be um, the table where we refer the more common um, changes that are associated with um, the different cancer types as well as the genes that are related to targeted therapy. And here's a larger, actually, listing of gene targeting. And again, it could be that any of these genes on the far left, uh, there are actually more than two dozens of genes on the far left. Any of these genes can confer a mutation, any, in any of these genes can confer resistance or sensitivity depending on what is the um, mutation. And the treatment can be identified or dictated um, depending on which gene is affected and um, what the mutation is. Okay, so, so what are the clinical applications of NGS multi-gene cancer panel? Uh, it's primarily for cancer patients with few or no standard treatment options remaining, and this is sometimes after um, identifying the hotspots or the ones that are um, available out there. And that, if the patient doesn't respond to treatment, given that um, initial stratification, the oncologist can be assisted in deciding on potential effective drugs or clinical trials um, that can be utilized by the patient. So most of the multi-gene cancer panels are actually for solid tumor, all solid tumor types, and pretty much it could be either a metastatic or a locally advanced disease on presentation. And when no actionable mutation is based on guidelines, um, then you can use this gene panel to actually get some of the other uh, drugs that are pretty much under clinical trial or emerging into the market. Um, they can be used for small specimen um, and um, they can be used for both recurrent and metastatic disease, as well as tumor of unknown origin or primary origin, and some rare tumors uh, with no specific standard of care can also be analyzed in this um, platform. But of course, results um, need to be guided um, in terms of um, how they could actually be used. And um, the evolving concept now varies with patients, clinicians, guideline committees, as well as payers. And pretty much within the context contextual stage of the disease, whether it's primary or metastatic within the tumor type, um, the guidelines um, and FDA-approved drug labels uh, 
as well as inclusions for clinical trials and anticipation of additional genes and mutants um, in the near future um, needs to be um, uh, there. And it is not a binary um, action. It is actually a continuum of evidence because um, the tumor can evolve, especially when there's metastasis, and in that uh, some of the drugs are quite new and there's just emerging. And I think one of the best things about whether uh, you target the primary um, tumor and knowing the genetic profile of that uh, primary tumor, one can also um, understand what the next treatment would be if there's resistance to known um, drugs. So this is pretty much like any other um, NGS cancer panels. There are some that have all the 400, 100 genes that they, there is, but pretty much they're the more common genes. And as I mentioned earlier, interrogating them simultaneously gives you um, an advantage of knowing some of the other driver mutations that are not very common. And it's actually enhanced compared to some of the other platforms that are readily available, including sire sequencing. Um, with NGS, one can also multiplex patient samples, and thus it reduces cost of testing, and also hopefully um, it actually reduces reimbursement and patient cost uh, out of packet and that you could also do sequencing, targeted sequencing, and modify the content after verification of uh, the panel um, that was previously developed. So most of the panels um, are, because of the technical um, considerations, they can use some other um, sequencing like, um, sequencer, sequencers like the Proton or the PGM, and they can use, as I mentioned earlier, alternate specimens like FNA and other cells. So specimen flow uh, after surgery in the OR or after FNA, one can use any of the tissue types and transport it for, um, to the pathology department. It could be um, that the tissue is prepared and um, formal, uh, formalin fixed, and um, it could be um, that they prepare the tissue blocks, and then from the tissue blocks uh, sections, one can extract DNA and then quantify and proceed to um, DNA capture and uh, enrichment and pretty much um, DNA sequencing. So just to give you a flavor, mutation distributions in common cancer types pretty much from melanoma, colorectal, lung, and breast. Um, they're not really that variable, but uh, just to show that they can have ranging from no mutation to actually four variants within the same tissue, and one can actually prioritize which driver mutations can be um, um, targeted. And in that, uh, also, just to mention that germline versus somatic testing, there's a little bit of a challenge in terms of using tissue, and I will sort of give that um, uh, part next after this slide. So how do we do annotation for um, tissue? Similarly, there are actually um, databases that are publicly available, but a lot of cancer centers, MSK, uh, Moffitt, and some of the other uh, cancer centers have their own mutation databases, and also there are available mutation databases um, in, uh, that are publicly available, but they're not curated very well. So one um, should know, um, and this is common knowledge in most labs, that some of the publicly curated databases are not as good, um, but um, one needs to understand that this is a very uh, dynamic um, um, field, and it could be that that mutation or a particular mutation is not available in terms of classification at the moment, but pretty much with all the other data sharing, one can identify exactly or at least classify a mutation based on um, information from the different databases as well as different publications that are available. So 
Mutations are identified and clinical relevance are given based on what is out there in terms of literature. As I mentioned earlier, there are national and international guidelines that actually um, um, give us more information on how to treat or manage patients and that um, the tumor type um, and additional tumor type can also be um, tested and gives us more treatment options depending on what drug has been used previously. And of course, the ones that are um, up and coming and there are no um, FDA approved um, drugs or that are available for that patient, the patient can be identified to join clinical trials. And uh, mentioned earlier, if the evidence are all based on publication as well as uh, available mutation databases for solid tumors. But um, it's not as simple as the germline. Um, pretty much uh, primary tumors are heterogeneous and depending on how much tumor or how much of that particular uh, tumor you had on your sample, that would be the mutation or the variant that one can detect. And so therefore, at times, um, um, sampling would be a good um, um, thing to do. Metastasis also can differ from primaries, and I mentioned earlier that tumors can evolve and they become resistant, and that depending on what clone is present, if one predominant clone is present in the primary tumor and that has been targeted by a drug early on, then that could have been really wiped out, but a secondary clone can be more resistant and um, be um, present or detected within the next um, testing. And again, as I probably would allude to, um, and more importantly with solid tumors, the copy number is very, um, the low copy number of mutations um, are very critical also to detect, and so, uh, sensitivity um, is also a requirement for the validation of this kind of test. So again, individuals uh, with cancer can have multiple tests, and that, of course, reimbursement is also a, an issue in terms of using next-generation sequencing-based um, tests. So there are other approaches out there. Um, they're commercially available in some um, laboratories. They have larger panels ranging from 100 genes to 400 genes. And it could be that you could use whole exome sequencing or genome sequencing with or without comparison to germline, and that could be probably something that um, some labs would eventually be able to offer. The more evolving or the more the hot one now is actually liquid biopsy or circulating free tumor uh, DNA, and it has its own pros and cons but uh, it could be used for monitoring as well as for um, drug selection um, if it is validated properly. So in summary, um, with um, all these advances, um, in the past years we have access to genetic testing for cancer predisposition as well as solid tumor genetic profiling. Um, there are important technical advances, but um, there are also differences in different uh, laboratories, so they may vary in terms of performance, and that one should be worried about how these tests were designed and the platforms that are used, and pretty much um, they can be um, probably gathered from the laboratories that are actually offering this test and that the other distinguishing or the difference, differentiating um, point for the different labs that offer solid tumor as well as germline mutation analysis is the databases that they use. At the same time, um, there are a lot of um, recent publications on clinical utility of multiple gene panels, and I alluded to, to one of the more recent ones, and that Overall, the field of genetic testing for predisposition to cancer is becoming fundamentally important and providing clinical validity and utility. And it does give um, hope to some of, the, some of the patients who don't have the FDA 
FDA drug sensitive uh, cancers, and in that um, nowadays, since we can do genetic profiling of tissue, one can be guided uh, on which drug can be used, and that um, the targeted therapy will be better used than a shotgun therapy. So with that, I think I have 10 minutes for question and answer. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Lafowen. Is there anyone that has a question? Hi, uh, this is um, Dr. Bob Wilden from NHGRI. That was a fantastic presentation. I came in about 15 minutes late, but um, uh, I really uh, enjoyed that. Um, I have a question about the um, uh, the um, cancer predisposition genes uh, yeah. and uh, and and sort of the historical part of that. So we think of BRCA1 and BRCA2 as fairly well established. And, um, and and clinically useful. And do you think that that's because um, they are more common and more, or, or because they are, um, it was sort of first, first to discovery and first to market, or is it because it is fundamentally more powerful than the other genes in the panel that you talked about? Okay, at least for breast cancer, um, the, our, in our experience, it's pretty much, uh, as you mentioned, um, it is the more common ones in terms of, I'm, I'm talking about experience in terms of the seven gene panel, and it's the, it is the more common, the BRCA1, BRCA2 arm is still the most common mutations that we find, and in that, of course, um, there are some emerging or low to moderate um, uh, penetrance um, genes like CHEC2 and uh, PALB2 that we are actually getting more cases on, but I guess because the other thing too is because the BRCA1, BRCA2 has been tested longer, and who knows if there's, it would, I mean, most, most probably it would stay as the most common one and the more dominant um, um, gene associated for breast cancer and ovarian, but it's it's not it's not fundamentally different than the others. Um, it's just sort of more common and has a longer track record. Um, I would say that that is true for now. Um, I guess the more testing or the more uh, individuals are getting tested with the larger panels, we can understand more probably. Because I, the other, I'm a clinical geneticist too, but um, the cancer is like to me, well, you're not testing a lot of other possible cancer syndromes. We are just testing mostly, as you have alluded to, the one, because BRCA1, BRCA2 is the most associated one and it's more commonly tested. So again, will that landscape change? Maybe. Um, and if you okay. can, if you know more, probably you can share more. No, okay. no, I just, I'm, I, it just, it just struck me that, um, you know, we we th we we think um, a lot about BRCA1 and BRCA2, and there's a lot of publicity, and there was, you know, um, Myriad um, Genetics put a lot of um, a lot of uh, publicity into it, and so there, and that's not true of most of the other genes that that mm -hmm. were they're sort of coming coming to light now. So it right. kind of got this head start. It, yep. it is a fairly high penetrance um, penetrance um, area, uh, which also helps it too. And I guess what I'm trying to point out is that is that um, we I think unconsciously make a division between BRCA1 and BRCA2, and then all the rest. And I'm yeah. not sure that from a clinical standpoint that that's fair. Yeah, and I'm with you in that. It's I think because the other thing too is that because we have more experience and we have more families that have been tested, we get all these referrals most, I mean, not just from um, probands within a family, but actually the ones that have been, I mean, had relatives who had been tested before. So, Which is another not, interesting point about that, that category of testing is that it has knock-on effects. So even though you may use a panel and the proband, uh, once you find, you know, um, associated mutations, then 
then you can do targeted testing and the, and the relatives at much lower cost. That's right, precisely. Hi, this is Dan Halibi at Horizon. Uh, thanks for the, the presentation, uh, very interesting. Uh, I have a question about your comments regarding the recent studies uh, talking about clinical utility for the tumor panels. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the challenges we face in developing medical policy is using the right outcomes when it comes to demonstrating clinical utility. Sure. And I think the concern I had with these studies is that they really didn't look at any kind of hard outcomes. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm using this in comparison to what we've seen. I think that it was called the SHIVA trial, which was uh, several months ago. And that was, I think, the, the closer to the right kind of study design we'd be looking for, where the, the result of the panel would guide therapy and then we'd look at hard outcomes. Whereas mm -hmm. these trials uh, in gem oncology, you know, one of them looked at perhaps increasing the yield of abnormalities, which is relevant, but certainly doesn't demonstrate clinical utility when it comes to changing outcomes. And then the other trial uh, was looking at, oh, actually, I think they looked for targeted mutations, but when they actually looked at what happened, it was observational, and they found that uh, very, very few patients actually did get the, the recommended targeted therapy. Mm. So are, are there other trials that... I mean, so far, am I misunderstanding these recent trials? And the second question is, are there other trials which would you think would be uh, more convincing, consistent with uh, a looking for hard outcomes? Okay, so you, let's, uh, I think, I don't know, I, the, the, the clinical actionability paper by Desmond and company are the coworkers. It is a multi-center trial. And it's actually, they actually have demonstrated that 4% of their cases have significantly changed in terms of management. So I think that that's like one of the more, uh, to this day, 